Hey, I've been looking forward to this weekend for uh, actually a very long time. So if you're new to the Bridgetown story, every single fall we do a vision series where we kind of circle the wagons and recenter on what we're all about as a church. And we've really been looking forward to this fall because we're actually going to lay out a, I'm not sure if new is the right word, but I guess so, a new vision for the next season in the life of our church. And I feel like it's a vision series kind of, I don't know, a decade plus in the making, at least in my own life. Years of learning and unlearning and trial and error and working things out as a church. And I feel like we have have some really, some stuff to lay on you, in particular a few weeks from now, that has the potential to reshape our church and really has the potential to transform your life from the inside out. So I just can't wait to get after it. Um, To start off, let's talk about Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus was a lot of things. We know him best as the Son of God, but he was also the Messiah, or another name for that is the Christ a word meaning the long-awaited king of Israel and the world. But if you were a first century Jew and you were at synagogue one Sabbath morning and Jesus were to show up and to teach that day, the odds are that the category you would have put Jesus in is that of a rabbi. Rabbi is a Hebrew word meaning teacher. A rabbi was a teacher who would travel from town to town with his yoke. That was a first century euphemism for his set of teachings or his way of reading the Torah or the Bible of the day. And uh, that's what Jesus was, a young, brilliant, kind of anti-status quo rabbi from the north part of Israel early in the first century. And of the 90 or so times that people talk to Jesus in the four gospels, right there at the beginning of the New Testament, upwards of 60 of those times, he is called rabbi or teacher. And this actually has all sorts of implications for what it means to follow Jesus. We say that a lot, in particular around Bridgetown Church. I'm a follower of Jesus. Are you, are you not a follower of Jesus? And wherever you're at in the answer to that question, you're welcome here. But I think it's become a cliche, and I'm not sure we know exactly what all it means. So let's read a story or two about Jesus the rabbi, and then start to unpack what it means for how you and I follow Jesus. To start, Mark chapter one, look down at verse 16. Here's the story. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and, what? Followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and, what? Followed him. Turn the page to chapter 2. Look down at verse 13. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. He was a rabbi, a teacher. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. Turn the page again to chapter 3. Look down at verse 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside and he called to him those he wanted and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 he appointed, Simon to whom he gave the name Peter, James son of Zebedee and his brother John, to them he gave the name something or other, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. One more, turn over to chapter eight. This is a well-known teaching of Jesus. Chapter eight, look down at verse 34. Then Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples. And he said this, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Did you see a pattern in there? In story after story, the call of Jesus was not, hey everybody, believe in me and go to heaven when you die or something like that. The call of Jesus was straightforward. Hey, come and follow me. Another way to translate that is come and be my disciple. The word disciple in Hebrew is talmudim. Can you say that? 
Yeah, and it can also be translated follower or student, but don't think follower like, I follow you on Instagram, Jesus, and I like every photo. Um, or don't think student like, you know, I'm a freshman at PSU or a senior at Reed or whatever. I go to class and take notes. I think it's way more than that. The English word that does the best job of capturing all that's in that package of Talmudim is this word apprentice. To follow a rabbi was to apprentice under a rabbi. Now, a little bit of backstory here. Discipleship wasn't invented by Jesus. He was not the first rabbi to have disciples or the last. Rabbi Hillel, who was a famous rabbi a few years before Jesus, had 70 disciples. Rabbi Akiva, another well-known rabbi a few decades after Jesus, he only had five, but he had thousands of men and women who would follow him all over Israel. In fact, discipleship didn't even start in Israel. It started a few hundred years before in Greece. Plato, for example, was a disciple of Socrates. Later, it spread across the Mediterranean. All that to say, discipleship was part and parcel of the first century world. But sadly, a lot of the time in the church, particularly if you grew up around the church and you're familiar with that language of discipleship, when we talk about it, it's absolutely torn out of its first century context. So here's the deal. Give me a minute or two or three to nerd out on you and unpack kind of first century discipleship. And uh, just if you're not like into watching the History Channel for fun, just stay with me. This is going somewhere, I promise. In the first century, discipleship was the apex of the Jewish education system. So there were three levels to Jewish education. The first was called Beit Sefer, a Hebrew phrase meaning house of the book. It was essentially a grade school where you would learn to read, write, do basic math, and you would learn all of it from the book, meaning the Bible. In fact, on top of that, you would memorize most, if not all, of the Torah. That's the first five books of what we now call the Old Testament. Can you imagine that? So those of you that have been reading through the Bible this last year, Genesis through Deuteronomy memorized by like age 12. You're thinking, that's why my kids are so messed up. Yes, you have nothing. Now, the vast majority of children were done right after that around age 12. If you were female, you would get married and start to bear children by age 13 or 14. So I know we have a long ways to go, sisters, and women's rights, but we've come a ways. So 13 or that's wow, that's young. And if you were male, then you would apprentice to your father in the family business. But the best of the best moved on to a second level of education called Beit Talmud, or the house of learning. There was a school that was literally built off to the side of the synagogue for men and men only, ages 12 to 14 or 15, who would learn from a full-time paid teacher and who would memorize most, if not all, of what we now call the Old Testament. So can you imagine that? Like it took us, what? eight months to read the thing. Can you imagine, act? and some of you are like, bro, I did not make it through February. That's okay, no guilt trip, we're in Luke right now, feel free to join up late. But can you imagine, all, now it's an oral culture, just keep telling yourself so that so you don't feel so stupid. All of that memorized in the back of your head. So now, at that point, almost everybody was done, but the best of the best of the best the Summa Cao Laude, the Rhodes Scholarship, the elite would go on to become a Talmudim or an apprentice to a rabbi. That was the third level of education. But this was over the top hard to even get into. You would sit for an interview with a rabbi if you were lucky enough to get one and he would just grill you. How well do you know the Torah? What about the Mishnah? Are you familiar with Rabbi Hallel's take on the Nephilim from Genesis 6? Or like whatever the thing was. He would interrogate you and if he thought that you had the smarts, you were intelligent enough, you had the acumen, you had the work ethic and the drive and the knack and the talent to become a rabbi yourself one day, then he would turn to you and say something like, come and follow me or come and be one of my Talmudim. Now, let's say that were to happen, right? And the odds are not in your favor. But let's say you made the cut and you became an apprentice. Then you had three goals as an apprentice of a rabbi. Your first goal was to be with your rabbi. Think of that line we read, quote, that they might be with him. Apprenticeship was 24-7, so it was not like, you know, class Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It was all day, every day. You would literally follow your rabbi around every single day. You would 
eat and eat three meals a day at his side, sleep at his side all day long. There's a well-known Hebrew blessing in the first century that sounded something like, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Keep in mind, this is the desert. It's the first century. There's a paved road is a rare thing, pretty much only in a city. And so at the end of a day, after following, and that was not a metaphor, by the way, that was literal, after following your rabbi from town to town, the hope was, if you were lucky, if you were blessed in Hebrew vernacular, then you were covered in the dust of your rabbi. So that was your first goal, to be with your rabbi. Secondly, to become like your rabbi. That line we read about how Jesus said to Peter and James and the guys, hey, follow me and I will make you into fishers of men. Now, most of the time we read that and we think it's like a cheesy pun or something like that. Like, hey, you're fishing for fish and I'll make you fish for people or something like that. That, that is not actually what Jesus, I mean, he has a better sense of humor than that. Um, it's actually quite funny, but it's lost in translation. Fishers of men was a well-known Hebrew idiom that for a teacher, so a great teacher, if it was just a great kind of rock star rabbi, was called a fisher of men because he would capture your mind and your imagination. Jesus is saying, hey, you're a fisherman. Come follow me. I'll make you into a great teacher. I'm a rabbi. I'm a great teacher. I will make you into a great teacher as well. And that was really the heart and soul of apprenticeship. We live in an age, particularly in a city like Portland and a generation like ours, where it's all about be true to yourself and you're a snowflake and there's nobody else like you in the universe and you're the most special thing ever and blah, 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 right? And like we're just all into like be weird and of course that weird is now normal. So if like you really wanna be weird, just be normal, um, especially in this city. But, and that's, that's fine, that's not even a bad thing. But in Jesus' day, it was not like that at all. Your goal was to become the carbon copy of your rabbi. I mean, you would literally follow him around and copy his every move, imitate his tone of voice, his mannerisms, his dress. You wanted to be him. So first, be with your rabbi. Second, become like your rabbi. And your, your third goal was to do what he did. Did you see that line about how Jesus' end goal was to, quote, send them out to preach and have authority to drive out demons? That's what Jesus had been doing, preaching and driving out demons. And at some point, he said, all right, now you're ready. You're up to bat. Did I just use a sports analogy? Holy cow. <laughs> Me. Wow. That was for the 20 of you that care. Um, and uh, that, that was your goal. Like, now you're up. It's your turn. The whole point of apprenticeship was for you one day to become a rabbi yourself. So the hope was that after a few years in the program or whatever, if you made the cut, that your rabbi would turn to you and say something like, all right, kid, I believe in you. I believe you have what it takes. Go and make disciples. Now, history lesson over. Let's flip this around from the first century to the 21st century, from Israel to Portland, Oregon. To follow Jesus is to apprentice under Jesus the rabbi. What does that mean exactly? Well, it means that you order your life around the exact same three goals. If you're taking notes, go ahead and write this down. First off, to be with Jesus. This is our first, and I would argue, most important goal, to be with Jesus, to spend every waking moment with our rabbi. But how exactly does this work now, my bet is that you're thinking. I mean, we're not actually with Jesus. I'm not Peter, I'm not James. Like, to follow Jesus is now more of a metaphor. In fact, Jesus is not here. He's at the right hand of the Father. We'll talk more about this next weekend. The short version is, it's through relationship to the Spirit of Jesus. This means that the first and primary goal of apprenticeship to Jesus is learning to live in a constant state of awareness of and connection to the Spirit. That is the baseline for all life in the kingdom of God. If you're new to the whole Jesus thing and you're just thinking, where do I start? Right there. Like, just start learning how to live in a constant state of awareness of and connection to the Holy Spirit. Just start carving out time in the morning or at night or a few short little spurts during the day to just touch in and connect with God. I think of John chapter 15. This is one of Jesus' most famous teachings. Let's read it really fast. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. 
remain in me, or that can be translated abide in me, as I also remain or abide in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So Jesus' metaphor for how to be with the Spirit is that of a branch abiding in or remaining in the vine. Dallas Willard says it this way, my all-time favorite quote ever. He writes, the first and most basic thing we can and must do is to keep God before our minds. This is the fundamental secret of caring for our souls. Our part in thus practicing the presence of God is to direct and redirect our minds constantly to Him. In the early time of our practicing, we may well be challenged by our burdensome habits of dwelling on things less than God. He's so gracious. But these are habits, not the law of gravity, and can be broken. A new grace-filled habit will replace the former ones as we take intentional steps toward keeping God before us. Soon our minds will return to God as the needle of a compass constantly returns to the north. If God is the great longing of our souls, He will become the pole star of our inward beings. His point is that living in a constant state of awareness of and connection to God all day long, that takes practice. This is what the spiritual disciplines, or what we prefer to call the practices of Jesus, are for. Things like silence and solitude, and prayer, and fasting, and reading the Bible, and Sabbath. These are time-tested ways to, in the language of Jesus, abide or remain in the vine, to present yourself before God throughout your day, throughout your week, throughout your life, just to take a moment to slow down and stop breathe in, to breathe out. God, you're here. You've been here all along, but now I'm here, and I've not been here. I've been in traffic, or I've been in the bike lane, or I've been on email, or I've been on Twitter, or I've been somewhere else, but I've not been here. But now you're here. I'm here with you together. I'm telling you, this is where the money is at. The best part about following Jesus is Jesus, like hands down. It's in this idea of practicing the presence of God. So that's the first goal for you and for me, to be with Jesus. Secondly, to become like Jesus. Out of that place of abiding in the vine, your goal and mine as an apprentice is to become like our rabbi, Jesus. Back in the day, if you grew up in the church, this was called sanctification. Now the kind of insider lingo for it is spiritual formation. Here's a definition that I think is really good. Next slide. Spiritual formation in the Christian tradition is a process, it's not all at once, it takes time, of increasingly being possessed and permeated by the character traits of Jesus as we walk in the easy yoke of discipleship with Jesus, our teacher. And the thing is, you know, I don't like to hear this, much less to say it, But the reality is we're all disciples of somebody or something. We're all being formed into the image of something. We wanna think, I'm unique, I'm independent, I'm at the end of the Oregon Trail, I'm my own man. Nah, you're not really, I'm sorry. We are a compilation of this influence and that and the other. So the question is not are you being formed, it's who or what are you being formed into? If you plot the trajectory of your character arc out a decade, two, three, 40 years into the future, who or what are you becoming? Are you on track to become Jesus expressed through your personality and your gender and your socioeconomic spot and all of that? Is that who you are becoming or is it somebody or something else? 
I don't know about you, but my guess is I'm not alone, and I want to grow and mature into the kind of person who is like Jesus from the inside out. So I want to live out um, the Sermon on the Mount, if you've ever read that. If not, go read Matthew 5, 6, and 7 in the next few days. It's this kind of all of Jesus' most famous teachings put into one spot. I, I want to become that kind of person, but not just in behavior. I'm after more than behavior modification, although I'll take that. But I want inward transformation from the heart out. I want to become the kind of person for whom it's easier to love my enemy than it would ever be to hurt them or kill them or gossip about them or waterboard them or whatever. I want to become the kind of person for whom it's easier to trust God because God is my father than it is to stress out and worry over bills at the end of the month or whatever it may be. I want what the New Testament writers call transformation. For those of you thinking, yeah, like I want it too, but how exactly does that work? Well, that's the main thing we're going to teach on in the fall. Don't have time to get into much of it tonight. To sum up the next two months of teaching, by the way, normally vision series is five weeks long, this year 12, so we have a lot of ground to cover. But to sum it up, it takes practice, and it takes practice in community. It won't just happen, and it won't just happen in a day or two or a year or three. We have to partner with God and with our community to become our true self, to become the man or the woman that God created you to be. We use the phrase, I think, life-changing way too often, but I really feel like we have some life-changing ideas to get into over the coming few weeks and few months. So, be with Jesus. What's the second one? Become, what's the second, wow, am I doing that bad of a job? Become like, so what's the first one? Be with Jesus, what's the second? Become like Jesus, yeah, we're like back in kindergarten, I'm sorry, that sounds unkind. Third goal is to do what he did. The whole goal of apprenticeship was to carry on your master's work, as I said before. Now this is where it's a bit tricky because Jesus was a rabbi, but he was more than a rabbi. He was also the Messiah and the Son of God. So Jesus' work was not only to teach about God and the Bible, it was to usher in the kingdom of God. And so our goal as an apprentice isn't just to know all about the Bible. Our goal is to actually join up with what Jesus is on about in the world. As I see it, you can break down Jesus' kingdom work into about 10 categories. Here's my short list. Preaching the gospel, teaching the way, healing the sick, casting out demons, eating and drinking with people far from God, doing justice, peacemaking, praying, prophesying, and standing up against religious and political corruption. Now here's the thing, if you're an apprentice of Jesus, then eventually, not like on day one or even year one, but eventually your goal is to be able to do all of that. Uh, this morning there was uh, an apprentice who's new to our church and our city, moved to Portland to apprentice to a plumber. So he's in a four-year apprenticeship program to become a plumber. So his goal at the end of that four-year program is not just to know all about plumbing. It's to be able to plumb a house. And by the way, plumb is a verb. I asked him. It's a verb. It's to be able to plumb a house. Your goal as an apprentice of Jesus isn't just to know all about Jesus, but it's to actually grow and mature to the place where you have the capacity to join in Jesus' kingdom work in Portland as it is in heaven. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? First, be with Jesus. Second, become like Jesus. Third, do what he did. It's a life built around those three goals. You know, the thing about Jesus, following Jesus, is it just does not work as a hobby. You know, like I'm kind of into Jesus and rock climbing or whatever. Um, it just doesn't work when it's kind of an aside to the main point of your life. In fact, it's actually really hard and difficult to do it that way and kind of it just does not yield the life that Jesus has on offer. Following Jesus makes the most sense when it's the whole point of your life. It doesn't mean that you need to quit your job and become a pastor or start a nonprofit. You know, follow Jesus as an investment baker or a teacher or a real estate agent or an architect or a full-time parent or a doctor or whatever your thing is. Follow Jesus right where you're at. But it means that the focal point of your life is apprenticeship to Jesus of Nazareth. And this is the kind of life that you're invited to, not only by me and by our church, but you're invited to by Jesus 
himself. That invitation is for you. Come and follow me. Come and be my, one of my Talmudim or a disciple or an apprentice. Now, notice a few things before we move on and talk about kind of vision for the coming year. First off, I just, if you still have your Bible open to Mark chapter eight, in that invitation of Jesus, you know, whoever wants to say, uh, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, follow me. Notice first that the invitation of Jesus is to become an apprentice, not a Christian. Whoever wants to be my apprentice or my disciple. Did you know that the word Christian is used a meager three times in the New Testament? It's actually only used in a negative light in the New Testament. Whereas the word disciple is used, are you ready for this? 268 times more than any other moniker for what it means to be the sons and daughters of God. Family is the next one after that. But that's like the category, to be a disciple, to be an apprentice. What's the difference between a Christian and a disciple? Well, a little bit of that is semantics, but in, for most people in the US, I think that all the word Christian means is that you believe in the basic idea of the religion that is Christianity, you go to church once in a while, which might mean like Easter, and you're a semi-moral person. For a lot of people, being a Christian just means you're like not Muslim or something like that. Being a Christian, for a lot of people in the West, is more about Jesus following you Jesus following you around to kind of give you a pick-me-up in the morning before you go to school or answer a prayer or two or three or help you out and you're like, she is really hot, all right, here you go, or whatever, rather than you following Jesus. This is a huge problem in the U.S. In a recent Gallup poll, and obviously the stats are way lower for a city like Portland, but nationwide, 76% of Americans claim to be a Christian but a number of independent surveys put the number of people actually following Jesus, and don't ask me how you measure that, but a number of independent surveys all put the number at right around 8%. So 76% check Christian, under 10 is actually following after Jesus. I just wanna say with a lot of kindness, That is an alien idea to Jesus and the writers of the New Testament. Here in Mark chapter eight, and really all through the New Testament, you have two groups of people. So you have the disciples, and you have the crowds. And when you read the disciples, don't just think about the 12, Peter, James, and John. That's a subgroup. That's the apostles. Jesus had hundreds, if not thousands, of disciples in Galilee, and really up and down Israel. He had male, and he had female disciples. That was unhurt. That's right, bring it on. As far as we know, there was no other rabbi anywhere around the time of Jesus who had female disciples, who was just way, way ahead of the curve. And this sharp divide between the disciples and the crowds is a literary device used by the writer Mark, and not just Mark, a number of other writers as well. It's a way of saying to you and me, the reader, which group are you in? Are you a face in the crowd? Like, who knows? Like, sure, okay, you're out, all right or are you a disciple or an apprentice of Jesus? And that is a question that two millennia later is still just as piercing. What about you even here tonight? Are you a Christian or are you a disciple of Jesus? Maybe you're just like, bro, I'm just confused. I don't even know what I am. That's great, we're happy you're here, you're welcome, take your time. But it's a question that you and I need to ask. Again, Dallas Willard said this. I feel like I should just say, tonight's teaching was brought to you by Dallas Willard. Um, Last quote, I promise. The greatest issue facing the world today with all its heartbreaking needs. So just pause, think about that right now. Think about everything that is cracked in our world right now. The political system, the war in Syria, racial injustice in our city and across our nation, the gap between rich and poor, like just everything, all right? The greatest issue facing the world today with all its heartbreaking needs is, in his opinion, this. Whether those who are identified as Christians will become disciples. Students, apprentices, practitioners of Jesus Christ, steadily learning from him how to live the life of the kingdom of the heavens into every corner of human existence. That's it. Jesus is not looking for converts to Christianity. He is looking for apprentices to the kingdom of God. So, I want you to notice that. Second thing I want you to notice is that this invitation is open to anybody. Quote, whoever wants to be my disciple. Whoever means whoever. Whoever means you, whoever means me. 
Now remember what I said before, discipleship in Jesus' day was for the best of the best of the best. It was not open to anybody. So a rock star rabbi like Jesus standing up in front of a crowd of thousands of people and saying, whoever wants to become my disciple, come take up your cross, follow me. First off, that was unheard of. Secondly, that would be, I don't know, the equivalent in our world of a rock star professor saying, you know, going on Twitter and saying, whoever wants a full ride scholarship to Harvard or Oxford or whatever, just direct message me, no problem, no high school diploma, that's okay, full ride, here you go. We laugh, nobody would say that. Exactly, nobody would say that. And here's Jesus. Doesn't matter where you've come from or not come from, doesn't matter what you've done or not done, doesn't matter if you are smart enough or intelligent enough or you have the work ethic or the drive or you have your act together or not. You are invited here, now, tonight, to step into the water in a few minutes and to follow Jesus. But here's the thing, this kind of life that Jesus has on offer, what Jesus at one point called life and life to the full. How great is that phrase? Life and life to the full. This kind of life where you're changed from the inside out to where you love your friend and you love your enemy, to where you're not racked by anxiety and greed and lust, you're set free from all of that, to where you become a part of a family with a father and with a brother and a sister. This kind of life that Jesus has on offer it won't just happen. It's not like if you just come to church three or four Sundays a month and read your Bible every other day, just do that for a while, and then boom, you'll just wake up one morning and you're like, I'm kind of Mother Teresa the second, you know? <laughs> it just, I wish that was the case, but it's not. It won't just happen. As I said before, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, is the most important teachings of Jesus all in one place. It's, at least as I read it, Jesus' manifesto for how to live as an apprentice into this new reality that Jesus called the kingdom of God. And it's not idealistic, right? So go read it on your own time. It's messy. Jesus assumes that you will sin and that other people will sin against you. He assumes that you will get into a fight, an argument, that somebody will sue you and drag you to court. He assumes that you will have not only a friend, but you will have an enemy. He assumes that you will lust after a man or a woman on the street, that you'll like want more money and stuff than you have and than you need. Like he assumes the messy, ordinary, here we are in the thick of it kind of life. But still, if you've ever read it, it's a high bar, am I right? Like, do not worry. How are you guys doing with that one? Uh. Like, yeah, no man can serve two masters. Like, hate the one, love the other. You cannot serve God and money. How's that going for all of you out there? It's a high bar. But here's the thing. If you pay close attention, you'll notice that Jesus begins and ends the Sermon on the Mount with this idea of practice. So here's the line right before Jesus starts to get into all the commands. So the you have, you've heard it said, but I say to you, notice this is what Jesus says right before that. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands that he's about to get into and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever, what does he say? Practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Then at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, so this is literally, next slide, the last paragraph. So after all the commands, listen to this. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and what? Puts them into practice. Is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So Jesus bookends the Sermon on the Mount with this idea at the beginning and at the end of practice. And this is actually something that Jesus, um, you regularly read Jesus teaching on, not only in Matthew, but all through the four Gospels. Meaning what? Meaning Jesus assumes this way of living, that's what the way of Jesus is, it's not just a set of ideas, it's a way of life. Jesus assumes this way is going to take a lifetime of practice, 
a lifetime, not a year or two or three of like, I dabble a few times a week, not a hobby. It's going to take a lifetime of practice. Anybody who is good at anything, a musical instrument, a sport, clearly not me, a second language, a skill of any kind, you all get, well, yeah, it takes practice. Now, when I say practice, please listen carefully because we could, we could go off the rails really fast right here. When I say practice, I don't mean, hey, you guys, this coming week, go read the Sermon on the Mount and just try really hard. All right, just try harder because last week, you kind of sucked it up, all right? So just try really hard. That's not what I'm saying. If you've been following Jesus for any length of time, you know that does not work. In fact, one of the most important ideas in spiritual formation is this. It's not about trying, it's about training. It's not about trying, it's about training. Um, here's the best metaphor I know. I think I used this last fall. Let's say, hypothetical situation, that you're out of shape and you're overweight. And for whatever reason, tonight you decide, you know, I want to run a marathon, 26.2 miles. To clarify, that's a long ways. How do you run a marathon? Do you wake up tomorrow morning and run 26.2 miles? No, what would happen if you tried? Even if you tried really hard, what would happen? Yeah, you would die. <laughs> Thank you, exactly. You would make it, I don't know, mile three, four, five, and then you would die. Uh, anybody, here, anybody here run a marathon before? You. I can't see out there in the dark. Who is it? Oh, hi, Amy. Um, so let's say Amy was there with you, and Amy just decided, do you still run? No? Okay, well, you did a marathon, so well done. You get out of jail for it. Let's say Amy was right there, and she were to run with you, and Amy, I know Amy, she's just delightful and kind and happy, and let's say that she were just to like, go for it, go for it, go for it, and as she has the Holy Spirit, she were to pray for you and anoint you in the name of Jesus. Maybe you'd make it like past mile three to mile five, and then you would die at that point. And then you would collapse on the side of the road, leaking lung fluid. So like, we laugh. Uh, clearly, that's not the way to run a marathon. So how do you run a marathon? Well, you wake up tomorrow morning and you run, I don't know, a mile. Some of you are like a quarter mile. <laughs> and then Tuesday, you run two miles. Wednesday, you take the day off. And so on and so forth. If you've ever run a marathon or any kind of race, you know it's like the regimen's not really that complex. Basically, each week you add on one mile to your long run. So your long run, the first week is like a mile and a half. And then the next week, it's two miles. And the next week, it's two and a half. And the next week, it's three. Then you take a break. Matt, who's over here, is in my community, is training for a marathon that's a year away. Did you run this week? Yeah. Bro, we need to talk tomorrow, all right? He's kind of, sort of training for, you just, man, that was my moment. You just, that, you just messed up my teaching because you're such a slacker, Matt, come on. So my point is, what happens is over a long period, listen, listen to this, over a long period of time through practice, so six months from now, nine months from now, 10 months from now, Matt or whoever, you're running 20 miles, you're running 22, you're running 24, you're running 26. You become the kind of person for whom running 26.2 miles is hard. It will always be hard. But unlike now, it will be well within your capacity as a human being. How? Through practice. If you want to run a marathon, you have to practice. If you want to experience life and life to the full, life with God all through the day, not this like scattershot, oh yeah, when I'm at church and when I have a moment with the Spirit, all through the day. You wanna become like Jesus and you want God to actually terraform your interior, interior world and then have it leak out everywhere you go. You wanna actually start to live into the teachings of Jesus, whatever the, if you want to experience that, it takes a lifetime of practice in community. Now, what does any of this have to do with the vision series and what's on the docket for the coming year? A brief history, and just this won't take long. For the last few years, we've been running after this idea of missional community. It sounds like a cult. It's not. It just sounds like it. 
Um, half a decade ago, if you were here back then, we rebuilt our church from a Sunday-centric megachurch to a network of missional communities spread out across the urban core of the city that gather here at First Baptist on Sunday nights and now at Chapman on Sunday mornings. And each community, as you know if you're in one, is organized around a mission, some kind of a focal point, a way to join up with Jesus' kingdom work in Portland as it is in heaven. And the idea was, hey, let's make mission kind of the driving force and then do discipleship and spiritual formation and all of that along the way. And it's been an interesting learning experience. It's been a great five years, but we have been learning a lot, and a lot through trial and through error, through success and through failure. And we've been wondering, I don't know, for the last two or three years, what if, you know, kind of mission first and then discipleship second is cart before the horse? So right idea, but wrong order. Every year we do a vision series and our tagline has been, it's about to change, but it has been family of missionary disciples. And I've noticed this trend over the last few years. We do the teaching on family and that's what most of our communities do the best. Not all of it, some of you are like, not mine, I'm sorry. But most of our communities do that really well and we kind of get that family, all right, you share a weekly meal with this group of people, okay. And we do the teaching on mission and then we get to the end and we do this teaching on discipleship, what it means to be an apprentice of Jesus. Basically the last 30 minutes, which if you've been around is not all that new. And I've started to notice this trend where it's like every year in that teaching, there's like this deep collective sigh, like an exhale in our church. There's this sense of, yes, that's it. Be with Jesus, become like Jesus. Then out of that, do what he did. And um, the thing is, that's the area of our church that we give the least amount of time and energy to. It's the area where, frankly, I as a leader have been the most confused on the how. Like, it's really easy to say the what, be with Jesus, become like Jesus. It's a whole other thing to say the how, and we'll talk about more of that in the coming weeks. But over the last few years, you know, we've been discovering life as a church and things like emotional health. If you've been around for that conversation, it has been life-changing for me and my wife and family and our leadership team, and I know all scores of you across the room tonight. We've been discovering life in the things of the Holy Spirit. People have been getting freedom and healing and wholeness and life, what Jesus called life and life to the full, and we want more of that, not less. So we want to change up how we format our communities, and if you know, at Bridgetown, the Sunday gathering is very important, but it is secondary. We really believe that kind of the home and the table, that's the most important part of the church. So if you're here and you're not in a community, love to pastor you into that next step. And we've already always said that missional community isn't a program, it's a platform for following Jesus. And if we find a better one, we hope to have the humility and the wisdom to change it up. And I think we have. We've been beta testing a new format for community in my community and a few others for about a year now. So think of it like this, in particular if you don't like change. I feel like we've been, here's my metaphor, it's like we've been on a journey together for the last six years, that's how old Bridgetown is, and our compass heading is not changing. Like we still have the exact same destination in Portland as it is in heaven. But we feel like it's time for our vehicle to change. Uh, think about any journey. So I was in London this last week, I started out in a car from here to the airport, then I was in a plane for like two days. <laughs> from Portland to London, then I was in a train from Heathrow into the city, right? And so we feel like in the same way, we have the exact same destination, but for the next leg of the journey, it's time to change our vehicle or kind of our mode of transportation. Not because the last one was bad at all, it got us here but because for the next step, in order to become, to grow and to mature in the kind of church that I really believe Jesus is calling Bridgetown to become, we need to change our mode of transportation. So a few name changes, this is easy stuff. So Bridgetown, a Jesus church, if you were here last weekend, became Bridgetown Church. So um, we have been doing this thing called Family of Churches for a number of years. It was great for a time, but as of last weekend, we officially disbanded for all good reasons. It's all fantastic, and I know like, just to clarify, it's Bridgetown Church now, not Bridgetown or Jesus Church. We're still following Jesus. I just want to make that crystal clear. 
And Jesus is probably like, what the heck, bro? Like, what are you guys doing? So we're now Bridgetown Church. Missional communities are now Bridgetown communities. So it doesn't sound so much like a cult, which is great. And then family of missionary disciples is now, here's kind of the new line, practicing the way of Jesus together in Portland. And we'll spend the next two months kind of on that idea. That's all just kind of, I hate the word branding, but language stuff. But the real money, and we'll get into this through the fall, is on this idea of practice. We've just been learning so much on the how we actually grow and mature to become like Jesus. And not to give anything away, but it's, it's not what you think. It's not what I thought. And my guess is it's not what you think. So we'll talk way more in depth about this in weeks to come. But basically, here's kind of what we'll do starting in January. Every two months, we'll take on one of the practices of Jesus. So um, we'll follow the Spirit year in and year out. It might be something like one of the, what are called the spiritual disciplines. So silence, solitude, prayer, fasting. How many of you are like, I don't even know what that is. I don't really wanna know what that is, actually. Um, Or Sabbath or something like that. Or it might be a spiritual formation exercise where you deal with family of origin or generational sin and you get healing and freedom. Or it might be kind of one of the kingdom practices of Jesus, that list of 10 things, practicing, preaching the gospel, teaching the way, healing the sick, all of that stuff. Well, so anything from like you and a cup of tea in your room alone early in the morning, all the way to you're out doing justice in the city as a community. We have this whole kind of list. And basically, we'll take on one of the practices of Jesus. We'll teach on it for a few weeks here on a Sunday and lay out a vision for how to do it. And then we'll go practice it in our communities. We'll have two months to basically hack, let's say, silence and solitude. So how in the world do you do that in a city, in an apartment that's like 300 square feet with four roommates? or with an iPhone in the digital age or as an executive or as a mom or what, how in the world, and we'll just hack it. We'll just go practice it because following Jesus takes practice and we'll practice it in community because we were never created to do any of this alone. And we'll just figure out over the years how, what does it look like to follow Jesus in our city, in our time, in the digital age, living in the Alphabet District or Forest Park or the Alberta Arts District or the Clinton neighborhood or wherever you call home, as a mom, as a teenage kid, as an empty nester, your stage of life, what does it look like to follow Jesus? And in closing, I just want to reiterate what I said before. All of you are invited to this. All of you, no matter where you're at or not at, like you're invited. And I don't mean by me, of course, yes, by me, but you're invited by Jesus. So maybe, you know, um, this is your first time at Bridgetown or second or third and you're only here because of your dang girlfriend or whatever. Um, You're not even sure what you think about God for that matter, much less Jesus. You're invited. Maybe you grew up in the church and you've been around for 10, 20, 30 years and you are a classic example of a Christian, but you're not a disciple of Jesus. You're invited. Maybe like me, um, a lot of you know this, but you know, I hit a wall a few years ago in my discipleship to Jesus where I was leading a church, a large church at the time, and in some ways I was, quote, successful, but I was not at all at a core interior level. There were some deep places in my life that my discipleship to Jesus had yet to touch. And so I had to go on this journey. I had to slow my life down. I had to reorient around the practices of Jesus. I had to step into community. I had to go through this process. And I had discovered so much life. I've discovered that, guess what? Jesus was actually right. Crazy, how crazy is that? (laughs) That life is hard. Jesus was really straight up. Life is hard. But life with God is unbelievable right in the thick of, I was at the hospital this afternoon with my sister, my little niece is in the hospital, right in the thick of that, right in the thick of dealing with your divorce or abuse as a child, right in the thick of the chaos of the urban digital world. Yeah, life is hard, but life following Jesus is so beautiful. It is life to the full, and every single one of you is invited. Let's stand and pray.